أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين بعد respected elders my dearest brothers sisters in iman assalamu alaikum right so we were at surah al ahqaf chapter 46 verse was it 46 here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging all those who invoke entities other than allah across the curtain of ghayb allah is challenging them and saying have you ever considered have you ever pondered that those entities whom you call upon besides Allah, ماذا خلقوا من الأرض? What have they created in this earth? أم لهم شرك في السماوات? Or do you believe that they have a partnership with Allah in controlling the affairs of the heavens? إتوني بكتاب من قبل هذا. Again, Allah demands proof. He challenges them. He says, bring forward a book that was revealed before this Quran. أو أثارة من علم إن كنتم صادقين. Or bring a piece of certain knowledge, knowledge that you know to be uh, with certainty from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Bring that piece of knowledge if you have, if you're sure of your claim before the proof and then verse 5 here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes an open declaration he says Woman this is a rhetorical question that allah is asking in chapter uh, 46 verse 5 he's saying Woman who can be more misguided who can be more deviant than a person who does dua who calls upon Mindunillah. Remember, as Alama Tabatawa explains, Mindunillah is a phrase you will encounter a lot in the Quran. And Minduni means less than. So Allah is saying, if you're calling upon any entity that is less than Allah, unless you believe they're equal with Allah or they're greater than Allah, na'udhu then this verse is not talking about those people. But anyone who is calling upon an entity across the kingdom of Ghaib and they believe that entity is Mindunillah, is lesser than Allah, okay? Then Allah is saying, what greater misguidance deviation can there be than this? That you are invoking an entity other than Allah and lesser than Allah. You're invoking an entity that will not respond to you until the day of judgment. So in this world, there is a thick curtain of ghaib that is separating you, you from that entity. And so that curtain of ghaib prevents you from communicating with that entity and prevents that entity from responding favorably to the pleas and supplications that you're making. And then Allah says, وَهُمْ عَنْ دُعَائِهِمْ غَافِلُونَ So essentially, any entity less than Allah that you call across the curtain of life is ghafil, is unaware about your dua. But they will not always remain unaware. On the day of judgment, Allah says in verse 6, وَإِذَا حُشِرَ النَّاسُ كَانُوا لَهُمْ أَعْدَاءً وَكَانُوا بِعِبَادَتِهِمْ كَافِرِينَ on the day of judgment, when the people will be resurrected and they will find out that you are invoking them and making dua to them instead of Allah, then Allah says, They will be their enemies. They will be the enemies of the people who used to make dua to them other than Allah. And they shall reject the worship. And remember, dua is, as the Prophet taught us, it is the brain of worship. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam swore by Allah in the narration in al-Kafi that he Allah dua the ibadah mentioned in chapter 40 verse 60 is dua dua is the essence of ibadah because it's an expression of servitude and slavery and neediness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all right so this is surah al-ahqaf and then we can proceed to the next verse 35 verse 40 here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Qul araitum shuraka'akum alladheena tad'oona min dunillah. Again, Allah is challenging those who invoke entities other than Allah or less than Allah. He's saying, have you ever considered the fact that the shuraka, those whom you have set up as my equals and rivals and partners and whom you tad'oona min dunillah, you're calling upon other than Allah, besides Allah, aruni madha khalaqu min al -ar. Show me what have they did on earth. Do they have a partnership in the heavens? Or have I given them a book so that they have clear evidence in that book in support of what they are doing? Yeah, is there any support in the book you have been given by Allah to show you that yes, together with Allah or apart from Allah, you can also make dua, 
and supplicate to other entities across the curtain of ghaib? Allah says it's either. It's neither. That it's none of the above. So Allah had given them options. Show me what have they created on this earth. Show me if they have a partnership in, heaven, in the heavens. Or show me a book that I've given you in which I've given you clear evidence for what you are doing. And Allah then concludes the verse by saying, actually, it's not none of the above. The fact is, The zalimun, the people who are going to zulm, zulm here can do iftira, shirk, all of these things are zulm in the eyes of the Quran. So Allah is saying the people guilty of zulm, they make illusory false promises to each other, meaning they will teach you that, yeah, you can call upon these entities besides Allah. They can hear you. They can listen to you. They can also respond to you and help you with Allah's permission, without Allah's permission. Different claims will be made left, right, and center. Allah is telling you this is all ghur. It is all illusory promises that have no at uh, attachment or connection with reality. Now you come to Surah An-Nahl. Again, Allah is showing you a scene of disassociation. Chapter 16, verses 86 to 87. Allah says, وَإِذَا رَأَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا شُرَكَاءَهُمْ قَالُوا رَبَّنَا هَأُولَاءِ شُرَكَاءُنَا الَّذِينَ كُنَّا نَدْعُوا مِدُونِكَ On the Day of Judgment, when the people who will have associated partners with Allah, they will see those partners whom they have associated with Allah. They will turn to Allah and say, رَبَّنَا our Lord, هَأُولَاءِ شُرَكَاءُنَا These are the partners whom الَّذِينَ كُنَّا نَدْعُوا مِدُونِكَ whom we used to make dua to and call upon other than you. Allah says, These partners or these entities will return, they will throw back their statement on their faces and say, You are liars. You are liars, as in liars about the fact that you used to call upon us. The fact that you used to tell people that we are the we are the ones who have taught you to do this. So in the case of Isa alayhi salam, the Christians will say, Yes, Jesus would be happy if we call upon him across the curtain of life. In the case of the Ghulat, they would say calling upon the Imams is fully approved by the Imams. So here Allah is saying, yeah, you can say this in this dunya, but in the hereafter, the people or the entities that you are supplicating to, they will tell you to your face, innakum la kathibun, you are liars. Wa alqaw ilallahi yawma idhinis salam. Allah says everyone will surrender before Allah on that day. Wa dalla anhum ma kan yaftarun. And all the iftira done, all the lies that have fabricated to justify their innovations and uh, you know shirk based practices all of those iftiraat will disappear they will vanish into thin air and they will be of no use to them then you have uh surat yunus chapter 10 verses 28 to 37 this is a long passage maybe we can go very quickly through it allah is again showing you a scene in the quran on the day of judgment we will gather all of them together Allah is saying we will tell those people who are guilty of shirk. And remember, we've already established in previous lectures that the Quran considers the act of invoking or supplicating to any entity other than Allah across the curtain of life. It considers this to be shirk. And the Imams have also explained how people can unknowingly fall into this shirk. So Allah is saying anyone, all those people guilty of shirk, we will make them stand in one place and the shuraka, that is the entities whom they associated with us, in worship, in dua, in anything else, we will, you know, gather all of them together. And then we will make them stand separately. And then the entities whom they used to consider equal with Allah or whom they used to give attributes of Allah to, their shuraka basically, their shuraka will turn to them and say, Ma kuntum iyana ta'budun. Say, we, you are not worshipping us. Okay, we are not prepared to accept that you are worshipping us. Okay, فَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ إِن كُنَّا عَنْ عِبَادَتِكُمْ لَغَافِلِينَ Most certainly, we were completely unaware about the worship that you were directing towards us. Yani you were supplicating to us, you were engaging in other acts of worship perhaps, but we were not aware of any of that. We were, إِن كُنَّا عَنْ عِبَادَتِكُمْ لَغَافِلِينَ We were unaware. Then Allah says, هُنَالِكَ تَبْلُوا كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا أَسْلَفَتْ That is the moment when every nafs will realize what exactly they have brought forward. وَرُدُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ مَوْلَاهُمُ الْحَقِّ They will be returned for judgment to Allah who is their true mawla, their true guardian and master. وَضَلَّ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَفْتَرُونَ And all the iftiraz that they did, every claim that they made about Allah for which they had no clear evidence from Him, all such iftiraat ضَلَّ عَنْهُمْ will vanish and disappear into thin air. The Quran repeatedly repeats this phrase. This phrase comes across 
uh, many, many times in the Quran. Allah is repeatedly warning us that if you have based any claim on iftira, and we've already, I don't need to explain again what iftira is, we have discussed it in great detail. Any claim for which you do not have a qat'i testimony from Allah Himself, if it is not endorsed by Allah in the book, it is an iftira, if it is, if it is a claim about ghayb. And that's why Allah repeatedly throughout the Quran warns you, He says, look, if you base your beliefs and practices on claims about me for which you did not have evidence in the syllabus, in the book, in the Quran, in the kitab that I had given you, then that is iftira. And every iftira that you have done or that you have based any belief or practice on, every such iftira will disappear and vanish into thin air on the Day of Judgment. It will not help you in my court. And then Allah challenges the, the people who make such claims. He says, Qul min as wal So this is one of the verses Ayatollah Sayyid Fadullah is pointing to when he says the Quran is categorically against al-vilayat taqwiniya, the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has delegated authority for sustenance and creation and all these other things to Imams of Ahlul Bayt. This is one of the most crystal clear verses of the Quran that repudiates that. Allah challenge, as a challenge, he asks, Qul man wal ardi. Ask them, O Prophet, who gives you risk from the heavens and the earth? Who is the one who controls the power of hearing and listening, of hearing and seeing? Who is the one who brings the living from the dead? The one who brings the dead from the living. Who is the one who is controlling and regulating the affairs of the entire universe? Those who believe in Allah, Taqwinia would say Allah has delegated this to the Imams. So they are doing all of this with Allah's permission. But Allah in the Quran is telling us that if you ask this basic simple question to the kuffar and mushrikeen of Mecca, Allah, even they have sense enough to, to say in response to this question that they would say, yeah, all of these functions that you've mentioned, giving risk from the heavens and the earth and controlling the power of hearing and listening and seeing and giving life and death and creating and regulating all the affairs of the universe. This is only Allah. Even the Kuffar and Mushrikeen of Mecca, when you confront them, they will say, yeah, these tasks only Allah is in charge and only Allah is doing them. So then Allah says, فَقُلْ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ So then why do you not fear him? <laughs> if you acknowledge that everything is in his control, then why are you making false claims about him? In verse 32, he says, فَذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمُ الْحَقِّ so once you have acknowledged and admitted that everything is in the control of Allah, so then that's it. So that is Allah, your true master, your true Lord, your sustainer, your guardian, your protector, your nurturer. He is He is the true Rabb. So then what is left after the truth that we are telling you except for dalal, except for error and misguidance and deviation? So where are you getting deviated? But then Allah then answers the question himself. He says, Allah says, actually, this is my sentence of adab, which I have already passed on those who are rebellious to me. They will not believe. No matter how many proofs you give them from the Quran, from nature, from here, there, they will not believe. Then Allah continues to challenge them. He says, Qul hal min thumma Those entities whom you are associating with Allah, can any of them begin the creation? Allah is the one who begins creation. Then he returns it. So where are you wandering? Is there any among your shuraka who can guide to the truth? Allah is the one who guides to the, to the truth. Okay, these are all the hujjahs Allah is completing on them. And then in verse 36, he gives you an insight into where they've gone wrong. He says, وَمَا يَتَّبِعُوا أَكْثَرُهُمْ إِلَّا ظَنَّا Actually, majority of these people, if you confront them, they don't even have a proper dalil. All they have is, وَمَا يَتَّبِعُوا أَكْثَرُهُمْ إِلَّا ظَنَّا They only follow zan, which is conjecture, hearsay, anecdotal evidence, shaky, uncertain sources of knowledge they have gathered from here and there. On the basis of that, they make these tall, tall claims. But when you confront them, you say, bring Sultan, bring the book of Allah, bring Ayat. They don't have anything. And they don't have anything that clearly and categorically can prove their case. And Allah says, Inna zanna la min al You can bring tons of zanni evidence. Allah says, zan does not have any relationship with the truth. It cannot stand in the place of the truth. Inna Allah alimu bima 
And then in the next verse, he tells you actually what is not zan. Okay, what, what can actually work in his court? So Allah says the Quran in chapter verse 37, he says, Quran He says, if you want a book for which it can be guaranteed that it has not been, it is not a product of iftira against Allah, then Allah says it is this Quran. Ultimately, it is impossible, it is inconceivable that this Quran could have been falsely attributed to Allah. This Quran is a confirmation of that which came before it. It is an exposition of the book. There is no doubt about the fact that it is from the Rabbul Alameen. Surah Yunus, uh, the last verse uh, I'm presenting from this surah, this is a passage towards the end, verses 104 to 107. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya min dini. Here the Prophet is being asked to proclaim and announce openly to anyone who is in doubt. O oh, Prophet, tell the people, tell everyone, O oh, human beings, if you are in any doubt about my deen, then let me tell you what my deen is. In a nutshell, this is my deen. My deen begins by negation, by rejecting everything that's false. So, oh, Prophet, the nutshell, the crux of my deen is that I do not worship entities lesser than Allah, which you worship. I worship the Allah who takes your soul at the time of death. I have been commanded to be of those who are believers. And I have been commanded to turn my focus and attention towards the deen as a Hanif. Yani I'm supposed to deviate from the path of shirk and come to the path of Tawheed and invite others to it. And do not be of those who are mushrikeen who associate with Allah who are guilty of shirk and then in verse 106 Allah gives you more insight into this command what does it mean not to be of the mushrikeen Allah says do not call upon entities other than Allah across the curtain of ghaib which can neither benefit you nor harm you okay فَإِن فَعَلْتَ if despite our giving you this command you still decide to call upon and supplicate to entities and make dua to other entities other than Allah who can neither benefit you nor harm you, then Allah says, إِنَّكَ إِذَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ You are definitely among the Zalimin. And why should you invoke and seek help and assistance from entities other than Allah when the reality is what he tells you in 107? He says, وَإِنْ يَمْسَسْكَ اللَّهُ بِالضُرِّنْ فَلَا كَاشِفَ لَهُ إِلَّا هُ If Allah afflicts you with difficulty or distress or harm, there is no force in the heavens and the earth that can repel that harm or ward off that problem from you. But if he decides to do good for you, then there is no force in existence that can repel or ward off his bounty and his generosity from you. He gives whomsoever he pleases of his rahmah from among his servants. And he is the most forgiving the most merciful. That being said, um, we now come to a discussion of where these ideas then came from. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so clear in the Quran, okay, then where is this idea coming from uh, that you know you can invoke entities other than Allah? And in fact, all the different types of ghulu that we've been discussing in the in, in all these lectures that we've had so far. The question remains, where did all of this come from, right? So for that, I want to give you some insight by hopefully sharing with you uh, some of the resources that we have in this regard. So in Rijal al-Kashi, this is one of the oldest and most authoritative books of Rijal. Ilm al-Rijal has got many, you, ha you can have an entire library of books uh, that have been written in Ilm al-Rijal. And Ilm al rijal is the science that deals with the narratives of hadith. So a lot of the ghulu that is popular today, if you confront the mainstream scholars, for example, or you confront those who support it, where will they bring you evidences from? Obviously in the Quran, you don't have any clear cut evidences for the ghulu that is going on. In fact, you have, as we showed you, you have evidences against that. But if you go into the books of hadith, Okay, even some of the oldest books of hadith like Al-Kafi, 
like Tahdeeb al Ahkam, Al Istifsar, Bihar al Anwar. You know, these are books that we've mentioned in the past. If you go to these books, you will find a lot of ghulu over there. So, in the books of hadith, and all of that ghulu, as I told you, the ghulat attributed it to whom? They attributed it to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. So now, where is the evidence for this claim? That all these narrations, you know, you many times people ask about Dua ul Faraj, people ask about Dua Tawassul, people are, there are so many, it's not just one or two, huh? there are a lot of narrations in the books of hadith that you can find with which you can support Ghulu and all the claims of Ghulu, like Imams have Ilmul Ghaib, Imams are running the universe, a lot of Ziyara literature in Kitab al Mazar, if you go to see many of the Ziyarat which the Ghulat invented inside those Ziyarat, like Ziyarat al Jami'ah, for example, is a classical example of an invention by the Ghulat in which they have inserted all kinds of Ghulu claims. Like instead of saying that Allah will take Hisab on the Day of Judgment, they say, no, Imams of Ahlul Bayt will take uh, Hisab on the Day of ju Judgment, things like that, right? So, where is all of that coming from? I hope you can see the screen. Uh, this is Rijalul Kashi, Ikhtiyar Ma'rifat al Rijal. It has been compiled by Sheikh Al Tusi based on the original compilation of Abu Amr al-Kashi. Here you have this narrator by the name of Al-Mughira ibn Sa'id. He is one of the ringleaders, one of the most notorious chiefs of the Ghulat. So let's see some, let's see what the narrations say about him. Qala Abu al-Hasan al-Rida alayhi salam. So here you have a narration from Abu al-Hasan al-Imam Ali al-Rida alayhi salam. He's saying, Kan al-Mughira ibn Sa'id yakzib ala Abi Ja'far alayhi salam. Fa'adha'ahu Allahu harra al-Hadid. Mughira ibn Sa'id used to specialize in inventing lies against Abi Ja'far. Who is Abu Ja'far? Al-Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam, the father of uh, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. And then here you have a narration from the son of Imam al-Baqir confirming this. Al-Imam uh, al uh, al Abu Abdullah al-Sadiq alayhi salam is saying that sami'tuhu uh, so here you have an open la'an. The Imam is invoking the malediction of Allah on Mughira ibn Sa'id. Why? Because He used to lie against my father. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually caused him to taste the taste of iron. Ultimately, this ghali got exposed and he was killed uh, because of how notorious he was. He was killed by the uh, by the authorities, not by the Imams, but ultimately that was punishment, a worldly punishment also for the lies that he invented. Then the Imam says, May Allah, may the la'na of Allah be on everyone who makes, who says anything about us that we have not said about ourselves. That is, remember the definition of ghulu according to the Imams. If you make any claim about the Imam for which you don't have certainty that the Imam himself made this claim about himself, then Imam al-Baqir in a narration of al-Kafi, which we referred to earlier, says that is the definition of ghulu. When the Imams were asked, what is ghulu? They said, fina ma la fi antusina, To make claims about us that we have not made about ourselves. So ultimately, everything that constitutes ghulu is a claim about an Imam that the Imam did not make himself. You are claiming that Imams can listen to our du'as. Imams never made that claim. This is ghulu, therefore. You are claiming Imams had Ilmul Ghaib, they have narrations denying Ilmul Ghaib. You are saying no, they have Ilmul Ghaib. So you are claiming something which the Imams are not claiming for themselves. Therefore, you are attributing Ghulu to them. So now, obviously, when you will go to other narrations, you will see that Imams are claiming Ilmul Ghaib. So where are those narrations coming from? They're coming from this guy and his supporters, Al Mughira ibn Sa'id, who specializes in lies against Imam al Baqir. So now here he's saying, the Imam is saying, May the la'an of Allah be on all those who say things about us, which we do not say about ourselves. And may the la'an of Allah be on everyone who removes us from the position of slavery to Allah. So ultimately, this was one of the missions of Ghulat. They wanted to equalize. They wanted to raise the Imams to the station of Allah by giving the sifat of Allah. So if Allah is a Razzaq, they want the Imam to be Razzaq with the permission of Allah. But ultimately, they want to establish equality between, between Allah and the Imams by sharing the attributes and unique divine offices of Allah with the Imams. 
So the Imams are saying the problem is when you share the, those divine offices with us, you're removing us from the position of slavery. So Allahi Khalaqana wa ilayhi ma'abuna wa ma'aduna wa biyadihi nawasina. He says our greatest and most precious thing for us is slavery to Allah. He is the one who created us. To him we are going to return. To him we shall be resurrected. And our forelocks, okay, are in his hands. So why are you basically separating us and isolating us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why are you trying to uh, raise us to divinity? Then here, uh, if you can see on the screen, you have this narration. This is a very important narration. Um, so if you will look at one of the uh, highlights that has been advertised for tonight's lecture, it is suspicion of hadith. Okay. So once people like al mughira ibn Sa'id and these others, they, they became very active. And then the companions of the imams also started finding about them through the imams. Now this is what happens. You have a companion by the name of Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, one of the most distinguished companions of al-imam Abu hasan Ali ibn Musa al-Rida sallallahu alayhi Okay. This Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman is a very close and trusted companion of the imam. He spends a lot of time with the imam. He has studied under the imam. And now look at him. The Shia are having a problem with him. The Shia of his time. So one of the, he says, Anna ba'da ashabina. One of the Shia asks him this question, Wa ana hadir. The narrator who is Muhammad ibn Isa ibn Ubaid is saying in my presence, one of the people, one of the Shias asked him this question. To whom? To Yunus. He says, Ya Aba Muhammad, this is the kunya of Yunus, uh, way, respectful way of addressing him. He says, Oh Abu Muhammad, ma ashaddaka fil hadith. What is the matter with you? Why are you so strict in hadith? Okay, this, by the way, is something they will also say to you today or to us today. <laughs> Many of the mainstream scholars, they have this problem with the reformist scholars. Why are you so suspicious of hadith? Okay, we have ilm rijal mashallah. We have this whole system of classifying ahadith. Why are you so paranoid? Why do you doubt the ahadith so much? This same objection is being raised against who? Against Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, because apparently he's also like us in this regard. Oh, we are actually on his footsteps. He has a very, he does not accept a hadith easily. And in fact, he rejects majority of the hadith that are being narrated on the authority of the Imams. That's why the Shia, they are objecting. They're saying, Yunus, okay, you are very close to the Imam, fine. But how does that give you authority to reject, you know, to be so strict in hadith? Why is it that you reject so much of what our trustworthy and reliable companions have narrated from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt? What is it that causes you to reject so many ahadith wholesale? Now listen to Yunus. He gives the response. He says, Haddathani Hisham ibn al Hakam. Hisham ibn al Hakam narrated this hadith to me. Who is Hisham ibn al Hakam? He's one of the most distinguished theologians from among the Ashab of Al Imam al Sadiq, alayhi salatu wasalam, right? And Al Baqir, alayhi salam, as well. So, Hisham ibn al Hakam, who is this trusted companion of the sixth Imam, he's, he narrates this hadith on his authority that he heard Aba Abdullah, alayhi salam, that is Al Sadiq, alayhi salam, saying, La taqbalu alayna hadithan illa ma wafaq al Quran wa al Sunnah. He says Hisham ibn al Hakam heard straight from Imam al Sadiq's mouth that he said, Do not accept any hadith from us except that which agrees with the Quran and Sunnah, the established Sunnah of Rasulullah. Aw tajiduna ma'ahu shahidan min ahadithin al mutakadima. Or if you find support for it, in those of our ahadith that have already reached you in such a way that you are certain that they're from us. So yeah, Imam, why are you telling us this, that we should not accept any hadith unless we find confirmation for it in the Quran and in the established sunnah or in those of your ahadith that are known to be with you, from you with certainty? Why all of this? He says, فَإِنَّ الْمُغِيرَةَ بْنَ سَعِيدٍ لَعَنَهُ اللَّهِ دَسَّ فِي كُتُبِ أَصْحَابِ أَبِي أَحَادِيثَ لَمْ يُحَدِّثْ بِهَا أَبِي because al mughirat ibn Sa'id, may Allah curse him and withdraw his mercy from him, inserted a hadith into the books of the companions of my father. He inserted a hadith which my father never narrated. Okay, so this is a huge bombshell that Rijalul Kashi is dropping. 
He's saying there is this work, there is this whole project that was going on of inserting a hadith into the books of the trusted companions of the imams. Why trusted companions? Because if you, if Mughira ibn Sa'id were to invent a hadith and then circulate it in his name, as soon as the Shia would hear Mughira ibn Sa'id is narrating this, they would say, oh, that blacklisted liar, that person who is cursed by the imams, you want us to accept his hadith? So no, Mughira ibn Sa'id is very clever. He says, don't use my name. I'm inventing a hadith. He has his agents. He tells them, insert these ahadith into the books of the trusted companions of the of the fifth and sixth imam. Now, how did he do that? This is something that this riwayah will give you more insight into. So have patience. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تَقْبَلُوا عَلَيْنَا مَا خَالَفَ قَوْلَ رَبِّنَا So the imam says, please fear Allah and do not accept anything in our name which goes against the qawl of our Rabb. The statement of Allah in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Rasul that you know to be from Rasulullah, don't, don't accept anything in our name because people have inserted false and fabricated ahadith in our books. فَإِنَّا إِذَا حَدَّثْنَا قَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلُ وَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ Because when we narrate, we only narrate from Allah and we narrate from Rasulullah. Okay? So this was the general instruction of Imam al-Sadiq to his companions after he learned of this project that the Ghulat had launched to insert a hadith into the books of the companions, the trusted companions of the Imams. Now listen to Yunus. Yunus is still not done. He's explaining to you his own methodology and experience. How has he become so suspicious of a hadith? He says, okay, so Hisham ibn al-Hakam told me this hadith, I memorized it, I put it in one corner of my head, I didn't pay much attention to it. But then he says, there was a big event in my life. Wafaytul Iraq, I came to Iraq. فَوَجَدْتُ بِهَا قِطْعَةً مِنْ أَصْحَابِ أَبِي جَعْفَرٍ عَلَيْهِ السلام. I found in Iraq a group of companions from the time of Imam al-Baqir. There were people who had met Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. وَوَجَدْتُ أَصْحَابَ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ السلام مُتَوَافِرِينَ So he says, I found a few companions of Imam al-Baqir in Iraq. And I found a large number of companions of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Where were they living? They were living in Iraq. He says, when I met these companions, فَسَمِعْتُ مِنْهُمْ I went up to these companions and I said, please share and narrate the ahadith. You, mashallah, you had the chance to study under Imam al-Baqir. You, mashallah, had the chance to study under Imam al-Sadiq. Can you dictate some of the ahadith that you uh, studied under them or that they narrated to you? So he says, I listened to their ahadith. وَأَخَذْتُ كُتُبَهُمْ And I took their books. Okay, I borrowed their books from them. The books in which they had recorded the lectures of Imam al-Sadiq, the ahadith of Imam al-Sadiq, the ahadith of Imam al-Baqir, I took all those books. And then he says, Alhamdulillah, fa'aradtuha min ba'du ala Abi al-Hasan al-Rida alayhi salam. After that, I had the chance to meet who? Al-Imam Abu al-Hasan Ali ibn Musa al-Rida salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. He says, as soon as I had the chance to meet Imam al-Rida, all those books were with me. I presented those books just for additional confirmation that these are the ahadith of your great grandfather and your jad. Mawla, you listen to these ahadith and just confirm them for me because now, mashallah, I have the opportunity to hear from you directly. So then when I go and narrate, I can tell that, you know, these are ahadith narrated by the trustworthy companions of Al-Baqir and As-Sadiq. And I personally myself confirm that these ahadith are from them. Who confirmed that for me? Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. But he says, to my shock and horror, what happened when I started narrating the ahadith from the books of the trustworthy companions, فَأَنْكَرَ مِنْهَا أَحَادِيثَ كَثِيرًا He started rejecting narration after narration. So many narrations he rejected. Who? Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. He says, أَنْ يَكُونَ مِنْ أَحَادِيثِ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ Almost every third, fourth, fifth narration I share from the book of the trustworthy companion, Imam al-Rida rejects it. He says, no, this is not the hadith of my jad. This is not the hadith of Abi Abdullah al-Sadiq. This is not the hadith of Abi, Abi Ja'far al-Baqir. Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, his head is spinning now. He's like, so what's going on here, Mawla? Are these not the books of the companions of al-Baqir and al-Sadiq? You are telling me a hadith here are not from your grandfather. They are saying these hadith are from your grandfather. So now Imam al-Rida shares the fact with him. He says, 
إن أبى الخطابي كذب على أبي عبد الله. He says all the lies that you see in these books are not from the trustworthy companions. These are lies that are inserted in these books by others. So I talked about Mughir ibn Sa'id. Now listen to, to the name of one of the greatest and most notorious uh, ghulat, the man by the name of Muhammad ibn Abi Zainab. His kunya is Abu al-Khattab. We talked about him in the previous lectures. We mentioned Al-Mufaddal ibn Umar ibn al-Ghadairi classifies him as a Khattabi, meaning he's a student of this guy, Abu, Abu al-Khattab. So Imam al-Rida alayhi salam says, Inna Abu al-Khattabi kathaba ala Abi Abdullah. Abu al-Khattab lied against Abu Abdullah al-Sadiq. La'ana Allahu Abu al-Khattab. May Allah send his la'na on Abu al-Khattab. وَكَذَلِكَ أَصْحَابُ أَبِ الْخَطَّابِ يَدُسُّونَ هَذِهِ الْأَحَادِيثِ إِلَى يَوْمِنَا هَذَا فِي كُتُبِ أَصْحَابِ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ So now the Imam is sharing another shocking piece of information. He says this Abu al-Khattab, he had his whole gang of ghulat. He has his ashab, his supporters, his companions. يَدُسُّونَ هَذِهِ الْأَحَادِيثِ They are inserting, they are fabricating narrations and then inserting them to this very day. Huh? The process has not stopped. It is continuous. These people are continuously adding hadith fi kutubi ashabi Abi Abdullah into the books of the companions of Abu Abdullah al-Sadiq alayhi salam. So then Imam al-Rida alayhi salam appeals to him. He says, فَلَا تَقْبَلُوا عَلَيْنَا خِلَافَ الْقُرْآنِ Do not accept anything on our authority if it goes against the Qur'an. فَإِنَّا إِنْ تَحَدَّثْنَا حَدَّثْنَا بِمُوَافَقَةِ الْقُرْآنِ وَمُوَافَقَةِ السُنَّةِ Because whenever we narrate a hadith, our ahadith are always in 100% full agreement with the Qur'an and the established sunnah. إِنَّا عَنِ اللَّهِ وَعَنْ رَسُولِهِ نُحَدِّثْ We only narrate on the authority of Allah and the authority of His Messenger. وَلَا نَقُولُ قَالَ فُلَانٌ وَفُلَانٌ We don't narrate from فُلَانٌ and فُلَانٌ and so and so. فَيَتَنَاقَبْ كَلَامُنَا so that our kalam should have any contradictions in it, okay? Inna kalama akhirina mithlu kalami awalina. The kalam of the last of us, the speech of the last of us is like the speech of the first of us. Wa kalamu awalina musaddiqun li kalami akhirina. The speech of the last of us confirms the speech of the first of us. And the speech of the first of us confirms the speech of the last of us. Fa idha atakum man yuhadithukum bi khilafi dhalik. So if anyone comes to you and narrates to you a hadith that go against what Allah has said in the Quran, what Rasulullah established in his sunnah, then throw back that hadith to that person. Return back the hadith to him. You know better what you have brought, but we cannot accept this because it's going against the Quran. Because every statement that comes from us has a reality associated with it. Our true and authentic teachings have nur on them. And everything that is disconnected from reality and does not have nur on it, that is from the qawl of shaytan. So now you understand why Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, this is the explanation Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman gives for his visceral suspicion of hadith. So many hadith are narrated on the authority of the companions of the Imam. That so and so trustworthy companion of the Imam said, Imam al Sadiq said this. And Yunus says, No, keep this hadith to yourself. I'm not going to accept it. Why? Because my Imam has commanded me anything. Because people have inserted a hadith in our books and they have penetrated our circle of trustworthy companions. Now our hadith are compromised. And because they are compromised, you cannot rely on them. Instead, you can only rely on those hadith for which you are able to find supporting evidence from the Book of Allah and from the established sunnah of Rasulullah, or from a hadith that you know to be from the imams with absolute certainty due to their transmission on a very large scale, such as these narrations that we are sharing with you themselves. Similarly, Yunus narrates from Hisham ibn al-Hakam, أَنَّهُ سَمِعَ أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ يَقُولْ كَانَ الْمُغِيرَةُ بْنُ سَعِيدِ يَتَعَمَّدُ الْكَذِبَ عَلَىٰ أَبِي Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman narrates from Hisham ibn al-Hakam that he heard Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam saying, that Al-Mughirat ibn Sa'id يتعمد الكذب He used to purposely lie against the father of Imam al-Sadiq that is Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam وَيَأْخُذُ كُتُبَ أَصْحَابِهِ and he used to collect the books of the Ashab now the question you might be asking how did the books of the trustworthy companions of the Imams fall into the hands of Al-Mughirat ibn Sa'id so Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam gives us the secret 
he says, look, look at this next line. وَكَانَ أَصْحَابُهُ الْمُسْتَتِرُونَ بِأَصْحَابِ أَبِي Mughirat ibn Sa'id had undercover agents who used to work for him. And these undercover agents used to disguise themselves as Shia and supporters of Imam al-Baqir. When Imam al-Baqir used to take classes and narrate a hadith, these people used to be hiding in the class. As soon as the class would be over, min ashabi abi. They used to go to the companions of Imam al-Baqir very innocently, and they used to say, you know what, uh, we were distracted or this, or they used to give some excuse and say, can we please borrow your book? You know, we forgot to write down this the hadith that were dictated today, or we forgot to, you know, down that so hadith. So by, and, and these ashab of Imam al-Baqir, alayhim salam bichara, they were innocent, you know, people, someone comes to you, you have a book of knowledge, knowledge from the imam. Someone comes to you and asks you that, you know, you, are, you have this book, please, I want to borrow it, I want to copy the hadith and share them and circulate them. If you are a true student of the imam, would you deprive that person of that knowledge? Especially if you don't know the background, you're like, okay, this person seems like an innocent person. He wants to learn more about the deen in light of the teachings of the imams. He's asking me for my book. You know, why should I be choyo? Huh? Why should I be stingy and keep my knowledge to myself? No, the ashab of Imam al-Baqir were generous people, especially in matters of deen. So when someone comes to them and says, please borrow your books, they say, fine, have our books. Ultimately, they were writing in books just for, you know, as an additional security measure. They mainly relied on memory. Okay, so they were memorizing the hadith as the imam was narrating them, but just for, you know, safekeeping and because the imams used to encourage it, they used to write them down in their notebooks as well. However, <clears throat> these companions of Mughira ibn Sa'id, they go up to them, they say, give us these books of hadith, they give them, Imam al-Sadiq says, these ashab bichara, they gave those books to uh, the companions of Mughira, the agents of Mughira, they take them back to Mughira. So he used to take those books, he used to insert kufr. Okay, this is not low level stuff, you know. It's not like he used to invent narrations that, you know, if you do... If you recite this surah, you will get this sawab and not, not low level fabrications. He used to insert absolute blasphemy into those books. Wazandaqa and heresy, you know, basically giving powers of Allah to any slave of Allah. That is heresy. That is blasphemy as far as true Islam is concerned, as far as the teachings of the imams are concerned. So that's why the imams, they say you, what you find in the books of the companions of our forefathers, you will find a lot of kufr and zandaqa in it. But you will find it having a proper sanada. So this Mughira, he used to invent the sanad as well, or he used to add it to the book. If, it, if the book belongs to a trustworthy companion, he does not even need to add a sanad because the companion himself is the sanad. Then he used to take copies of those books. He used to distribute them among his own gangsters and his own undercover agents. He used to say that, okay, now go and spread and circulate these books, which I've added my stuff to, among the naive Shia, among the innocent public. So now the Imam gives you one final concluding statement. He says, everything that you find of ghulu in the books of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam or his companions, all that ghulu or all the ghulu that you find in the hadith of Imam al-Sadiq or Imam al-Rida or any other Imam of Ahlul Bayt. Where is all of that ghulu coming from? Imam says, the origin of all the ghulu in the books of my father is what al mughirat ibn Sa'id fabricated and then invented and inserted into their books. So this is where you are getting all of these things from. So when you open Al-Kafi today, now Al-Kafi and all the Shia books of Hadith, from where were they compiled? So when you ask the scholars of Hadith and Rijal, they will tell you there were the 400 usul, al-usul al arbamia al This is a famous term. They might not necessarily have been 400, but there, there is a famous, you know, number, okay? Like they say, Fortune 500, okay? So you have al-usul al-arba'amiyah. 
you have the 400 usul. What are the usul? The usul are these uh, manuscripts that contain the ahadith of Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq, which their companions compiled, okay? Which their companions used to. When the Imam is dictating hadith, the companions are writing it down. And the book in which they have written this down is called Asl. So you will hear when you go deep into hadith studies, you will hear this so and so is the Asl of, for example, Hamad ibn Uthman. Hamad ibn Uthman is a companion of Imam al-Sadiq. He has an Asl, meaning he has a book in which he has recorded the hadith of the Imam. What the Ghulat do is that if they see Hamad ibn Uthman is renowned for being a trustworthy companion, they send their gangsters and their undercover agents. They say, you go up to this uh, Hamad, tell him to borrow his book. They borrow the book, they make copies of it, they insert their khurafat, their ghulu, their kufr, their shirk, and everything wrong that they want to promote. They invent, insert it where? Into the book of, for example, Hamad ibn Uthman. Then they say, circulate this among the Shia. When the Shia receive the book, they say, whose book is this? It's the book of Hamad ibn Uthman. What do you know about Hamad ibn Uthman? So, oh, he's one of the most trustworthy companions of Imam al-Saliq, for example. So they say, oh, so then this book is therefore reliable. Now, when they open the book, they see all kinds of khurafat and ghulu and everything. But they are like, you know what? If the Imam has said it, then it must be the case. And so the Shia end up accepting so much of the ghulu and the khurafat and the kufr and the shirk that has been promoted in the names of the Imams. That's why you feel, you see here, for example, the Imams repeatedly, I'm telling you, this book is full of narrations in which the Imams are warning. Now the Imams have discovered that the Ghulat have done this. They are appealing, they are pleading, begging their companions, please be careful of these people. Do not take a hadith from, from the books, even if they are trustworthy books of our forefathers. Don't take it. Just follow those hadiths that agree with the Quran, that for which you can find supporting verses in the Quran. If anything, if you find a claim being made in a hadith, for which no support exists in the Quran, just close your eyes and throw it away. Throw it against the wall, as you will see in other ahadith. So here you have another appeal from Abu Abdullah al-Sadiq alayhi salam. He once says to his companions, Allah ibn Sa'id. May Allah curse Mughirat ibn Sa'id. May Allah curse the Jewish woman whom he used to go to to learn magic and sorcery. These ghulat were into all kinds of uh, you know, dodgy, dark sciences, things like that. Fasalabahullahu al-Iman. Allah took uh, took their iman away from them. And then the imam clears the picture. He says, look, I swear by Allah, ma nahnu illa abid. we are only slaves, okay? Anyone who tries to make us lords or partners with Allah or tries to give us the powers of Allah, you understand that this is ghulu, okay? This has got nothing to do with us. Ma nahnu illa abid. We are just slaves. Ma naqdiru ala darrin wa we are telling you very clearly, we do not control any harm or any benefit. In rahimana fa bi rahmatihi, if Allah has mercy on us, it is his mercy. In azabana fa bi dhunubina, if Allah punishes us, it will be because of our sins. Wallahi ma lana ala Allahi min hujja, we don't have any case against Allah. Wala ma'ana min Allahi bara'a, we don't have any immunity from Allah that we will be able to save people on the day of judgment or save ourselves from his adab. We have no such thing because the ghulat were feeding people with the idea that the Ahlul Bayt, you know, you just believe in all this ghulu and Ahlul Bayt will save you on the day of judgment and they will rescue you from the fire of hell. The Imam is clearing. In many hadith, you see Imam al-Sadiq saying, la taghurru wa la taghtarru. Please don't get fooled and don't fool other people. We do not control anything on the day of judgment. We don't have any power. We cannot save you. If you have disobeyed Allah, there's nothing we can do for you. If you have obeyed Allah, Obviously, all kinds of doors are open for you. And then the Imam says, Look, we are going to die. We will go to our graves. We will be resurrected. We will be made to stand before Allah to answer, to give hisab. You know, may the curses of Allah be on them. Why have they invented all of these things? They have caused adha to Allah, to his messenger in his grave to Amir al-Mu'mineen, to Fatima, Hassan, al Hussein, Ali ibn al-Hussein, Muhammad ibn Ali. They have hurt all of these people and they have damaged the mission of all of these people. Look at me, I am present in front of you, Imam al-Sadiq is saying. I am the flesh and blood of Rasulullah. When I sleep at night, I am terrified. Terrified of what? Of the adab of Allah. Okay. But these people, they sleep in security. 
that Ahlul Bayt will save us. The Ahlul Bayt themselves, Imam Sadiq is saying, I, I am in fear of what will happen to me on the Day of Judgment. While these people are promoting the idea that no, the, the Day of Judgment, we will be in control and we will go around rescuing people from hell and doing this and that. He says, الْجِبَالِ وَالْبَرَارِ He says, these people should look at our seerah. We are so fearful of Allah. And we don't make any tall claims that Allah will give us this and Allah will give us that. Why are these people doing all of this? I disassociate and declare my innocence before Allah from all this al-ajda and al-barrad, Abdu Bani Asad, Abu Khattab. May Allah's curses be on these people. All of these things that they have promoted and spread about us, I declare my innocence from all of this. Now listen to this. This is a real bombshell that, uh, and a real amazing statement that the Imam gives us. He really empowers us. He says, Wallahi la bina. Now here he's giving us a test, which most of us would fail, but Imam is teaching us. He's saying, suppose if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to test you, okay, Allah does not test people with such a difficult test, but he says, suppose Allah were to test you. How would he test you? Suppose he were to take away our intellects and make us, you know, turn us into robots, okay? And in robotic mode, he were to command us to tell you that you should believe in all of this ghulu. That, for example, you should supplicate to us. You should believe we have ilmul ghaib. You should believe. Suppose if we were telling you all of these things, like Imam al-Sadiq really was saying all of this stuff. Na'udhu billah. He says, لَكَانَ الْوَاجِبُ أَلَّا يَقْبَلُوا Would you accept it or would you not accept it? So this is sometimes where I like to test my students to ask them. So here now we have the case is clear. Mughirat ibn Sa'id and all these people are lying against Imam. But suppose if Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq himself were to come to me personally, and he was to say that, look, you recognize me, right? I'm Imam Ja'far. And I am telling you, and I'm telling you with the authority that I have as the grandson of Rasulullah, that Allah has given me all of these powers. I am the one giving risk. I am the one who responds to the du'as and supplications. I am the one you should be calling upon besides Allah. If Imam Ja'far himself were to tell you all of these things, would you accept them or not? Well, majority of us, I think, would say, yes, we would accept them. The only reason why we're not accepting these things is because Imam himself has rejected these things. He has disassociated himself from such claims. But Imam al-Sadiq wants to take his Shia to a higher level. He's saying, no, 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 no. He's saying, wallahi, I swear by Allah, if Allah were to put you into a test whereby you were to hear all of this ghulu and shirk and kufr that these people are spreading in our name, Suppose you were to hear this from our mouths, it would be wajib on you to reject our statement, meaning the ghulu and the kufr and shirk that these people are promoting is so dangerous. And it is so clearly against the Quran that Imam al-Sadiq is saying that even if I were to say this and endorse it, it would still not become approved. Allah would still not approve of it and it would still not be justified for you to accept it. So how about when I am disassociating from it and declaring my innocence before Allah? فَكَيْفَ وَهُمْ يَرَوْنَنِي خَائِفًا وَجِلًا أَسْتَعْدِ اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَتَبَرَّعُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْهُمْ Repeatedly the Imam does bara'a, he declares his innocence, he disassociates himself, he says, أُشْهِدُكُمْ He says, I call all of you to bear witness. You know, at least those of you who are in front of me on the Day of Judgment, when Allah questions me, please justify in my favor. I am a person from the direct descendants of Rasulullah. I have no immunity from Allah. What does he mean by Allah? This claim that the Ghulat had spread, that the Ahlul Bayt can save whomsoever they want on the Day of Judgment from the fire of hell, whether you have disobeyed Allah, obeyed Allah, Ahlul Bayt will have absolute power. They will save whomsoever they want and they will leave to rot in hell anyone that they want. Imam is saying, ma ma'iya bara'atum Allah. I don't have any such power or control on the Day of Judgment. In ata'atuhu, he says, I myself am under examination just like you. If I obey Allah, he will have mercy on me. Wa in asaituhu azabani azaban shadida. And if even if I were to disobey Allah, Allah does not have discrimination, huh? That because he's from the Naslu Rasulillah, he's from the descendants of Rasulullah, therefore we're going to deal with him with velvet gloves. No. He says, in asaitu, if I disobey the laws of Allah, if I go against the Quran, if I defy the established sunnah of Rasulullah, azabani azaban shadida, Allah will punish me with a terrible, terrible punishment, aw ashadda azaba. In fact, with the worst of the punishments, Allah will punish me with. 
So basically in this book, this is the oldest and most authoritative book of Ilm al-Rijal that I've shared with you over here. And once you go, you go through the narrations, there's narration after narration after narration in which the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have declared their bara'a and they have basically explained to all of us exactly what happened, how did this come. Um, I don't know how much time there is left. If I could share one last statement from Ayatollah Muhammad Saeed Tabatabai Al Hakim. Let's um, do that last, and then we can. You, and then you can wind up. Right. So uh, Ayatollah Muhammad Saeed Tabatabai Al Hakim, he shares this narration from Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman in his Al Muhkam. So th these narrations that I just shared with you, okay, you never hear them from the member, interestingly, but all the Maraja, the great Mujtahideen, every every single mujtahid in his advanced level uh, discussions on ilm al-usul. There is a whole subject that they teach you as part of ilm al-usul that is called al-bahthu ta'arud al-adilla shar'iya. Ta'arud al-adilla is a subject where they teach you how to deal with contradictory evidences because there, this is a fact. When you go to the books of hadith, you will see a lot of contradiction. Okay, You will see du'as like du'a kumail, for example, in which only Allah is being invoked. But you will also see du'as like tawassul, in which the imams are being invoked. And both are being attributed to the imam. So now you as the Shia, you are confused. You say, who, who do I trust? Right? There is a direct contradiction. So what the scholars of Rijal and Hadith and Usul do is they teach you how to deal with this contradiction. So, and they explain to you how did this contradiction end up in the, in the Shia books in the first place. So then they share all of these narrations that I've shared with you right now. They share these narrations with you in those advanced level. So all the transcripts you have, or what, what I have here, Al-Muhkam Fi Usul Al-Fiqh, this is, these are the transcripts of the advanced level lectures of Ayatollah Muhammad Sa'id Tabatabai Al-Hakim that he delivered in the Hawza of Najaf. He is among the great Maraja of Najaf together with uh, Sayyid Sistani. Uh, you find that after, so first of all, he authenticates these narrations that I've shared with you, particularly the narration of Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman on page uh, 213. He says, Ma rawahu al-Kashi bi sanadihi sahih he says, this is an authentic narration from Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman in which, you know, I've already shared with you the text of the narration, so I'll not repeat it. Uh, but basically the narration in which people ask him, why are you so suspicious of the ahadith? And he mentions how people have inserted ahadith and all of that. And then look at what he says towards the end of this. He says, riwayat hi al -muhimma fil -maqam. He says, these riwayat are very important because ma'a he says these riwayat are very important because they show us how unreliable the books of hadith are. So when you're dealing with a book of like Al-Kafi, even a Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Baqra Sadr used to say, whenever you place your hands on a narration, in Al-Kafi or Bihar Al-Anwar or any book of Hadith, the first thing you have to assume is it is a fabrication because you don't know. The Ghulat did not mark their narrations and say this narration we are inserting into the book courtesy of Mughir ibn Sa'id. No. <laughs> they tried their level best to insert the narration in such a way that it should not seem, you know, it should not seem odd. So they tried to and that's why they had this phenomenon of Idraj, interpolation. They take actual Sahih narrations and then towards the end of it, they add their khurafat. So you look at the sahih part and you're like, you know what? This is definitely coming from the imam because what comes from the imam has the nur on it, right? So they steal the nur of the imam and then they add their khurafat to it. So if you are not a critical thinker and many of the compilers of hadith, unfortunately, you are not critical thinkers, you end up accepting it because you're like, you know what? The starting of the hadith is so beautiful. This cannot come from anyone except the imam. Yes, but the last part has been inserted by the ghulat, but obviously you don't know that, so you accept it. That's why Ayatollah Muhammad Sa'id Tabatabai uh, al-Hakim is saying that for zahiru hadhi nusus, the conclusion he presents is that the, what becomes apparent and obvious from these riwayat is tawaqqufu al-amali biha ala atidadiha bil qara'in al-qat'iyya min al-kitabi wa sunnah That you should act on no, no riwayah is actionable. No narration of Ahlul Bayt you can act on until you can find qat'i qara'in qat'i supports for it from the kitab and the established sunnah and wa'adam kifayati riwayati thiqati laha. 
and the apparent me uh, the apparent and obvious lesson of these narrations is that you cannot go by what the scholars of Rijal, for example, when the scholars of Rijal tell you that this the narrators of this narration are trustworthy, that has become meaningless now. Why? Because the Gulat, they did not insert their ahadith into the books of the discredited companions of the Imams. No, they inserted their ahadith into the books of the trustworthy companions. So today when I come and narrate to you something from a trustworthy companion of the Imam, you cannot be certain that it is from the Imam himself unless what that narration is saying is in agreement with the Quran and the established Sunnah. So I think with, the, and yeah, I guess the only other evidence I wanted to share was from Rijal ibn al-Ghada'iri, which is also a dangerous piece of evidence which shows you um, how Ibn al-Ghada'iri talks about this man by the name of Abu al-Mufaddal. He says when, when his books were discovered, Abu al-Mufaddal was one of the king of the Gulat, one of the most notorious uh, uh, inventors of hadith. So this Abu al-Mufaddal, when his books were discovered later on, Ibn al-Ghada'iri personally, this great scholar of Rijal, he looked into these books. He says, do you know what I discovered to my shock? He says, this person, he had a notebook in which he has just chains, asanid, okay? And in another notebook, he just has texts of narrations. The question is, if you are compiling a book of hadith, you usually share both the chain as well as the sanad. Why is this person separating the sanad and the matan? Now, the lay person will be like, okay, I don't know. But the scholar of Rijal, this immediately rings alarm bells like anything. He Obviously, Ibn al-Ghada'iri, he's, he's very clear about this. He says, this person is a wadda. This person is basically, we have discovered books that are coming from the warehouse of Gulu. So what these Gulat were doing is they were studying the hadith and isolating the chains that the scholars of that time were declaring to be authentic. So any chain that is recognized as authentic, the Gulat are quickly copying it in one book. And then in another book, they are preparing uh, the hadith that they want to attribute to the Imam. So then in a third book, what they do is they take the mutton that they have invented and they take the chain that they have isolated and they join the two and then they circulate them. So now this hadith, mashallah, even if you take it to Ayatollah Khoi, Allah's teacher, Ayatollah Sistani, no one can demolish the chain because the chain is impeccable. And if we had the time, we would show you narrations that have impeccable chains, yani beautiful chains. You look at the chain, you, you start smiling because it's all trustworthy, trustworthy. Thiqa, 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 sometimes double thiqa. But the narration is clearly narrating stuff against the Quran. So now what do you do? Well, now, thanks to all these researches, you know that this is what the Gulat were doing. They were attributing the worst lies they were attributing all kinds of kufr and blasphemy and heresy and shirk and ghulu to the imams of Ahlul Bayt. And the imams of Ahlul Bayt appealed to us. They said, please don't be fooled by that. Take ultimately mihwariya of the Quran, centrality of the Quran. Make the Quran your guide. Any narration that agrees with it, that finds support in it, you accept it. Any narration that does not agree with it, does not find support in it, reject it. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for that, Sayyid. Um, it's very interesting what you are saying is is almost about what a thousand years old give or take um, in journalism yes, yes. so basically journalism, today we are facing the same problem uh, there is there's a whole there's a whole system of uh, miscommunication malcommunication and disinformation so um, I'm going to share with you uh, something on, 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 the, on the chat, which you can take a look at. Um, and I think this would be interesting to see that it hasn't changed so much ever since where we are coming from until today. We still have people who are creating and using fake experts and all this stuff. So it's, it's really interesting that it's still there. Yeah, very true and very rightly observed. Yeah, anyway, okay. Uh, there's a question, uh, there are two questions there, but Abbas Bai has raised his hand, so let's give him a chance to ask his question. Abbas Bai, short question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Last time, I think you mentioned about an ayah in Surah Al-Tawbah, 
اتخذوا اخبارهم وربانيهم اربابا من دون الله and immediately after three ayahs Allah addresses the believers يا ايها الذين امنوا ان كثيرا من الاخبار وربانيه ليأكلون لا يأكلون اموال الناس بالباطل So he's giving an example of rabbis and monks who are religious leaders, respected in that community. That applies also to Islamic Ummah. So we have been guaranteed salvation, especially us. If a certain percentage is done away with. Now, if one looks at the Quran objectively, read the Qur'an, Allah guarantees salvation. Surah Al-Mudakhtir. Fi jannatin yatata'aluna anil mujrimin ma salakakum is akhara. Qalu lam nakun min al-musallim wa lam nakun nus'imun miskin. Salah and miskin. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates the masakin in the Holy Qur'an. Masakin. Go and embrace One must miskin ASAP generative guarantee. He sent the most men of the Quran, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, with Hazrat Hidr to go and protect the assets of the Masaki. You know, three incidents, the first incident was it. Hidr alayhi salam drove a hole in the box. And on explanation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, Amma Safina ku, wa kanat lil Masaki. مساكين يعملون في البحر وكان وراهم ملك يعقد كل سفينة نسبة يصيب مساكين أنا ده إنسانس ده من إنسانس سورة القلم three children of a farmer very very good man he keeps aside a day of harvest before day of harvest for the masakin and take something from his farm he dies his the three children After burying the father, come back and uh, take, a, take a off that we are not going to allow yes, Masakin to enter and give the share. Pantaloku, Payatakafatuna, Allah Yakulana Al Yoma is him. So what happened for Asbahat Kasarim? The whole farm was turned into ashes. Sarim comes from Soma. So Jannah is so easy, you pray, embrace the miskin, Allah is guaranteeing you Jannah. So such things are not highlighted. Jannah, mm. the way pathway to heaven is being made difficult. So I don't know what the insight is. Shukran. <clears throat> Jazakumullah for that uh, observation. Yes, you're very right about how the Quran ties the issue of salvation with taking care of and having concern about <clears throat> the masakin. So the Quran always uh, has this thrust on two fronts. Uh, firstly, at the level of huququllah and then huququl nas and huququl ibad, right? So even in Surah Al-Haqqa, for example, when Allah talks about the person who is being, for whom he instructs to be thrown into the hell, the first thing he says is, إِنَّهُ كَانَ لَا يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ الْعَظِيمِ He did not believe in Allah the Great. And the second thing is about the food of the poor who are hungry. So yes, absolutely. You're very right in pointing out that the Quran uh, gives a lot of attention to the issue of the poor and the needy and feeding the starving and contributing all of these uh, things uh, to, to their welfare. And yes, <clears throat> within every religious community, there is also this trend that you mentioned uh, earlier from the verse of Surah At-Tawbah, whereby <clears throat> sometimes religious leaders the Ahbar and the Ruhban that the Quran talks about, they collect funds in the name of the poor and the needy, but then they don't end up spending it uh, in the right causes and they don't end up giving it to, to the poor and the needy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens them in Surah Tawbah. Uh, he says, Yawma yuhma alayha fi nari jahannama fatukwa biha jibahuhum wa junubuhum wa zuhurum. That on the day of judgment, they will be branded with, with all that gold and silver that they had hoarded and kept away from the poor uh, and the needy. 
So jazakumullahu khairan for that uh, insight and that observation about how the Quran really focuses on this and uh, associates it with the whole idea of salvation. Okay. That would have been an easy out for a lot of us. <laughs> um, okay, there is a question from Anis that says, uh, is this Mufazal the same guy who has hadith about our body and why uh, Allah has made them the way he has? Okay, so I think uh, there is some confusion regarding so Muf You have one narrator by the name of Al Mufaddal ibn Umar. This is someone we discussed in previous lectures. Today, the narrator that I was talking about is Al Mufaddal. Let me see if I can share the screen. So you can see for yourself. Um, you can see the screen. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is this is basically Rijal of Ahmad ibn Hussein al Ghadairi. Okay. And this is entry number one forty nine and thirty four. Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn al Muttalib al Shaybani Abu al Mufaddal. Okay. So that is al Mufaddal. This is Abu al Mufaddal, the father of Mufaddal, but not this Mufaddal. Okay, this is a different Mufaddal. And Ibn al Ghadairi, this is what he tells you. This is page 99 of his book. He says, Wadda'un, Wadda'un means a specialist manufacturer of ahadith. Kathirul Manakir, he's someone in whose ahadith you will see the strangest and weirdest and most outlandish of claims. And by the way, when he says the strangest and weirdest and most outlandish of claims, Ibn al Ghadairi is living in the fifth century. Huh? So these claims, he's actually talking about your and my aqidah today. <laughs> Because Ayatollah Mamkani in the first lecture, I already told you, Ayatollah Mamkani is saying what we consider to be standard Shia Aqidah today, in the past, it was considered to be outright ghulu and kufr and shirk, mm. you see. So in the time of Ibn al-Ghadairi, the narrations of uh, Abu al-Mufaddal are problematic because he is Kathir al-Manakir, he is narrating the weirdest so for Ibn al-Ghadairi, the claim that Imams, for example, have Ilm al-Ghayb, this is the most strange claim because the Quran clearly denies the Prophet having any Ilm al-Ghayb. Right? Uh, the Prophet is clearly instructed in the Quran to tell the people that I do not say, and I have never claimed that I have knowledge of the Ghayb, right? So for Ibn al-Ghadairi, it would then be very shocking to see narrations or to see someone narrating narrations where the Imams are making an opposite claim. Similarly, today it is the standard practice to, to call upon the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and to make dua to them. Dua tawassul today, no problem. But in the time of Ibn al ghadairi if you were to recite this, and that's why Ayatollah Imam Qani, the, the scholar I mentioned in the very first lecture that I gave, he then goes on to mention how he says, if today's scholars of Qum and Najaf, mainly Qum, he, uh, he talks about, he says, if these scholars were to be taken to the fifth and fourth century, they would be expelled from the city of Qum because their beliefs would be considered to be heresy and blasphemy. And, and Ayatollah Imam Qani then even goes on to say, quote another scholar who says, yes, we admit that our beliefs today were considered ghulu in the past. And if, if today we were to go back into the fifth century through a time machine, we would get kicked out and expelled big time from, from Qum and we would not be allowed. And in fact, there were narrators who were expelled and kicked out from the city of Qum for narrating narrations today that are being narrated in the members of Qum itself and by people who have graduated from Qum. So one uh, narrator who was expelled from the city of Qum by the chief of the Qummis, the, the greatest scholar of Hadith and Rijal in Qum at that time uh, was a Sheikh Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Isa, al-Ash'ari al-Qummi al-Razi. He was the grand mufti and Sheikh of the city of Qum. And he was a companion of the 10th and 11th Imams. So he had actually studied under the Imams. When he saw Sahal ibn Ziyad al-Adami al-Razi, this is a Ghali narrator, when he was, and Sheikh Ali Karmali, if you look at his sessions, he has been referred, many of the narrations he discredits because, or he identifies as problematic, which is his very respectful way of, of telling you that it is unreliable, problematic, is because of Sahal ibn Ziyad al-Adami. Sahal ibn Ziyad al-Adami al-Razi was expelled from the city of Qum by the chief of the Qummis, Sheikh Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Isa al-Ash'ari al-Razi al-Qummi. Why? For narrating narrations which, in the language of Ibn al-Ghadairi, are manakir. But today, those narrations, so for example, one of the narrations of Sahal ibn Ziyad al-Adami al-Razi is that if a person, he claims the Imam said that if a person were to spend his entire life 
doing tawaf of the Kaaba, I don't know, fasting, praying, all of the ibadat he mentions, he dramatizes the whole thing. But at the end of the day, if he does not have the wilaya of Ali, he will enter hell. This is attributed by Sahal ibn Ziyad to, the, to imams of Ahlul Bayt. Now today, this is narrated in the member. And this is narrated in Qum itself. If you go to Qum, you don't be surprised if you hear a speaker or a khatib narrating this, or people who have graduated from Qum, you will hear them circulating, narrating, promoting this narration. But this Sahal ibn Ziyad, who is narrating this narration in Al-Kafi, he, if you go and look at the, what the biographical dictionary, what Ibn al-Ghadairi will tell you, what Najashi and Pusi will tell you about him, is they will tell you, Baba, this is a discredited, notorious Ghali who was expelled from the city of Qum because of narrating a hadith, of inventing a hadith against Ahlul Bayt. And then look at this, what he says, Ra'aytu kutubahu, Ibn al-Ghadairi says, so this is Abu al-Mufaddal we're talking about. He says, I saw his books, Fihal asanid min duril mutun. I saw the asanid in it, the chains, without the text. Wal mutun min duril ahadith. I saw the text without the asanid. <laughs> so basically this guy was, he is the, the owner of a warehouse where a hadith are being invented left, right, and center, and they're being attributed to the imams of Ahlul Bayt. All right, so those are two different mufadals. All right, there is a question here that says, uh, can you explain once more how we arrive at across the curtain of Ghaib as being what defines shirk and iftira? Which ayah in the Quran provide the basic derivative and terminology of across the curtain of Gabe? Um, second question, what was the ayah in Quran which equated supplication with ibadah worship? Or was that only from hadith? Um, I think the across uh, the curtain of Ghaib uh, can, can be seen then on, on your uh, YouTube videos. Uh, unless you want to shortly just touch on that and, and uh, there's a there's a request for the ayah of quran which equated supplication with ibadah and worship um so well, that you can answer right okay so yeah with regard to the first question i think we've responded to it in the previous uh, sessions and the only thing i'll say is that it's not one single verse it's the whole quran the quran clearly shows you of cases of people seeking help from each other when they are in the same realm. For example, the Shia of Musa, the supporter of Musa, uh, doing istighatha from Musa. That was when Musa was physically present in front of him. The Quran gives you several such examples. The sons of Yaqub, they go to Yaqub, they say, ya Father, do istighfar for us. No problem with that. Why? Because you are in the same realm. But then the Quran talks about making dua. Don't make duas to entities that can neither benefit you nor harm you. Why? Because once an entity is across the curtain of ghaib, they cannot benefit you and harm you. As the Quran has already explained, they cannot even listen to you. They cannot even listen to the voice of the Prophet. So let alone you and me. So that is a quick response to the first question. With regard to the second question, um, <clears throat> which ayah in the Quran equates supplication with worship? I would say there are several such verses. Chapter 40, verse 60 is just one example that is cited by Imam al-Baqir. He says, Allah there says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ اُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ your Lord has said, call upon me and I will answer, I will respond. Those people who are too arrogant to worship me, they shall enter the fire of hell in a state of humiliation. So when Allah says, those people who are too arrogant to worship me, Imam al-Baqir says, he's referring here to what? He's referring to what he mentioned in the first part of the verse, which is, Udu'uni. So essentially, the message of the verse is call upon me because calling upon me is not just you're asking your hajat and getting your wish list, you know, dealt with by Allah. You are actually worshiping Allah. Every time you do dua, dua, as the prophet tells us, mukhul ibadah. It is the brain of worship. So that is one verse of the Quran, but there are several other verses. For example, uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, iyyaka na'budu, only you do we perform ibadah wa iyyaka nasta'een, and only you do we seek help from. Now we seek help from a lot of entities, from our teachers, doctors, this, that. Why is that not haram? Because it's not across the curtain of light. So when we are saying, there is a mahzuf, there is an omitted part, which is understood. If something is very obvious and understood, the Quran omits it. So when we are saying, only you do we worship, and only you do we seek help. The omitted part is, only you do we seek help from across the curtain of light. Because otherwise the statement would be false. Inside the curtain of ghaib, yani in our realm, 
We seek help from a wide variety of people. And the Quran is also okay with that because it gives us examples of that. Uh, I hope that was answered uh, sufficiently for the person who asked it. Um, the next questions here says, why do Muslims focus more on Sanad than Matan? Uh, doesn't, doesn't putting Sanad over Matan make us more susceptible to fabrications? Yeah, mashallah, that's a beautiful observation and it is absolutely true. Because the ghulat, they invented, as I showed you, this example of this ghali. What is he doing inside his warehouse, his hadith manufacturing unit? He has an entire book of, of sanads, which he knows he has done research, okay? And he has isolated all the chains which the scholars are authenticating in his time. And by the way, those chains are regarded as, as authentic even to this day. Because ultimately, the scholars of Elmer Rijal... Uh, Sayyid al khui and Sayyid Sistani, they don't, uh, when they tell you so and so narrator is reliable, the question is, how do you use Sayyid Sistani? Uh, how do you know he's reliable? This person was living in the time of the Imam. So, how do you know? He will tell you, Baba, I'm not making this claim from my pocket. This is what the classical Rijalists have told us. So, what the Gulat are doing now, they're saying, okay, so the classical Rijalists are the Hujja, right? They were the Hujja in their time. They look at what the classical Rijalists have said about the different narrators. From the list of you know, authenticated narrators, they isolate these names and then they build chains out of them. And then they take all their hulu and khurafat and shirk and kufr and they associate it with those chains. That's why the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, when they are asked, what is the solution? People have inserted these false hadith into your books. They never say study al rijal they never say any time a narration comes to you, check the sanad. The imam knows checking the sanad will not help because the sanad is perfectly authentic. These gulat are attributing a hadith with the most authentic chains to the imams because they're not fools. They know that if they attribute a hadith with inauthentic chains, they will get exposed immediately. So that's why they're attributing a hadith to the imams with authentic chains. The imam is saying, don't even accept the authentic chains. Remember the objection against Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman is, the Shia of the time are asking Yunus, what is the matter with you? You are rejecting a hadith narrated by our trustworthy companions. What's up with you? And then he explains to them, he says, Baba, the narrations of the trustworthy have been compromised. So you're dealing with a poisoned glass of water that was initially pure, but poison has been added to it now. Now, until and unless you can isolate the poison, and separate it from the water with absolute certainty. Don't drink from that glass. All right, thank you so much. It seems there are no more questions currently. Yeah. All right, so, so if there are no further questions, I would do once again like to take, oh, there is a question. Yeah, it says, Salam, would you like to say uh, the Najafi scholars are more reliable than the Kumi scholars on the member? Um, yeah, I think I would agree with that because Najaf is much better in Ilm al-Rijal. So I personally, at the, so the scholars in Qum who graduate from Qum, in Qum they teach you very relaxed methodology for Rijal. And the scholars of Qum, another very big problem with, the, with them is that they are very, very deeply interested in rescuing narr narrators and narrations. So many, many of the narrations with um, narrators with Sayyid Sistani and Sayyid al khui have dismissed and say the Sistani and Sayyid al-Khui, when they dismiss, they don't dismiss willy-nilly. They try their level best to see whether the case against a certain narrator has weight in it or not. Remember, the jarh has to be mufassal and mu'allal. It has to be evidence-based. You can't, even if a classical rijalist, even if Ibn, Ibn al-Ghada'iri comes and tells us so-and-so is da'if and he doesn't give us the reason, we don't accept that. We say, Baba, this is just a claim. Give us evidence. Show us the evidence. So Ayatollah Sistani and Ayatollah Sayyid al-Khui and also Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id Tabatabai al-Hakim, these are all Najaf scholars, their manhaj in Rijal is good. It's quite strong in the sense that they do not unnecessarily, they don't have this, uh, this desire to just rescue as many narrators as we can by hook or by crook. No, they have a very strict methodology. Anything that agrees with that methodology, they will accept. What disagrees, they will reject. I told you the example of Sayyid al-Khui, he rejects even a simple claim like ghusl before ziyarah of Imam al-Hussein being mustahab. This is such a low level claim. Even if it is mustahab, no problem. It's not a big iftira. But no, Sayyid al-Khui says, no, 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 no. I was thinking that this narration is sahih. Now that it is not, I'm rejecting it now. 
So, yes, I would agree. The scholars of Najaf are much, much more reliable in Ilm al Rijal. Uh, and the scholars in Qum, unfortunately, they are much more interested in rescuing narrators because of which you have to take what they say with a pinch of salt at times. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Looks like we are taking a lot of salt right now. <laughs> okay, right. Asans, for your time and uh, and closing the session. So um, I'm going to give you the floor, and then you can close because I think you want to say something, right? Yeah, just uh, last words that I wanted to say. I want I wanted to really extend my gratitude to Al Hajj uh, Samir Bai Karmali and to the Al-Islah team for organizing these lectures. And basically our communities have been, have grown up listening to, you know, one side of the story. Alhamdulillah, what this platform is doing is truly amazing. I would commend you and I would, uh, you are always in my du'as. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and protect you and grant you the tawfiq and courage to keep up with this amazing work that you're doing. It's a great service that you are rendering to the community. These are researches that there is no other platform that is, you know, if you want to share the other side of the story, people think Shiaism is one uniform madhab, is only one opinion, one, there's a lot of diversity. And unfortunately, the lesser known views, they don't get coverage. They don't get media coverage, I would say, because there are no media platforms that are actually willing to give scholars who are willing to present alternative researches. So mashallah, I think you guys have definitely, you are the pioneers, you have led the way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for that, bless you for that, protect you and uh, increase and enhance your tawfiqat and definitely whatever we can do in our capacity as researchers to support you inshallah we will always do and what the all those who are interested in finding out the haq should obviously also uh, i hope they will support you and uh, obviously this was the last uh, lecture for this series inshallah once we resume after the holidays or whenever it is a new topic will be chosen based on the feedback that has been uh, the feedback is very important and it helps us determine the course to to take so inshallah i look forward to seeing all of you uh inshallah next year with a new and fresh topic uh and inshallah may allah bless all of you and keep all of you under his protection thank you everybody for joining